<laughs> so welcome everyone and good evening or good whatever time zone you're in. I know we're coming in from all over the country and all over the world, so welcome. And um, thank you for joining us for this first ever inaugural LGBTQIA and beyond webinar. We're really excited to have this this year and we're hoping we'll provide a lot of good conversation and information to all the applicants and everyone who's tuned in tonight. My name is Amy Lorber, my pronouns are she, her, and I am currently a fourth year medical student at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I am serving as one of the co-directors for Future Pubes this year. Um, hi everyone, my name is Chama Kawachuko Sheher. I am a Nigerian international medical graduate from the University of Lagos, and I'm currently a junior clinical fellow at the King's College Hospital in London. I also serve as one of the co-directors for Future Peds Res. As always, we'd like to highlight our founders here at Future Peds Res, who are now second year pediatric interns, Michaela and Nick, who have been a source of support and guidance to us throughout these sessions. We'd also like to acknowledge Dr. John Frona, Vice Chair of Education and APPD Recruitment Action Team member, and Colin Hughes, who is the Associate Executive Director, respectively, with the APPD, who have helped make these webinars a reality. We're also grateful for the leadership of Dr. Pat Guatvian and Dr. April Buchanan, who are presidents of APPD and Comcept respectively. We are super excited to have you here with us and hope that the information that we give you today will leave you with some gems of um, knowledge for this upcoming PEDS March 2023 season. Great. And it is now our pleasure to introduce you all to our Assistant Director of Equity for LGBTQIA applicants, Eduarda Kasuli. And we'll let her take it from here. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was mute. Uh, so uh, thank you, Amy, for that wonderful intro. Uh, I'm Eduarda Casali. I'm a IMG from Brazil. Uh, and I'm serving this year as a assistant director of uh, of equity for LGBTQ uh, applicants. Um, and thank you all for turning in tonight. Uh, it has been a, an amazing time planning uh, this webinar and I would like to thank the entire uh, Future Pets Res uh, team, especially the webinars, equity and publicity team for working hard to make this happen. So, uh, now let's delve into our objectives. So our objectives for tonight, uh, as you can see here, we're hoping to essentially empower applicants through the match cycle, help connect applicants with mentors and sponsors, uh, navigating both the virtual webinar, or sorry, not webinars, navigating virtual webinars as well, but <laughs> navigating virtual interviews, as well as avoiding some major pitfalls. So tonight's event will be a panelist discussion and um, our Assistant Director of um, Equity, Eduarda, will be um, hosting our esteemed panelists who you can see on the screen. And then following that, we're going to open the floor to any remaining questions you uh, might have. We will also be joined by all of our webinar attendees here on Zoom, as well as actively engaging PEDSMATCH 2023 Twitter um, and live tweets throughout tonight's session. So if you're here, please tell your classmates, colleagues, friends who are not here to join in and log on 
and if they haven't if they haven't already done so and to use the hashtag um, FPR webinar to make sure that we see your tweets if you have any questions here in zoom please feel free to also put them in the chat for everyone to see if not you can um, also message them to any of the co-hosts that you see on zoom so I'll now um, give the floor to Eduarda um, to introduce the panelists and then continue with the Q&A session. Eduarda, you have the floor now. Thank you. So um, on behalf of Future Pet Res, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists tonight. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Juan Carlos Venice. Uh, who completed his medical training in Indiana University School of Medicine, uh, Master's in Public Health at the Harvard TH School of Public Health. And lastly, his family medicine residency at the IU Health Ball Memorial Hospital. Uh, currently, he is an assistant professor of clinical family medicine at the IU School of Medicine and is also the medical director of primary care at Damien Care Carers in Indianapolis. Hi, welcome, <laughs> Dr. Venice. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our, our next, next esteemed panelist is Dr. M. Brett Cooper who completed his medical training at the Wright State University uh, Boomshoff School of Medicine in Dayton, Ohio. Um, his pediatric residency at the University of Toledo Medical Center and adolescent medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Um, currently, he's an assistant of pediatrics at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Uh, furthermore, he sees patients in the Adolescent Medicine Clinic at Children's Medical Center in Dallas and is the co-director for the Ambulatory Care Clerkship at the UT Southwestern. Um, welcome, Dr. Cooper. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Well, next up, we have Dr. Stephen C. Cook. Uh, who completed his medical training at Boston University School of Medicine, his internal medicine pediatrics residency at the Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, and his fellowship in pediatrics cardiology, adult cardiovascular medicine at the Ohio State University. Um, currently, he serves as the director of and fellowship director of the IU Health Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program. Uh, also, welcome, Dr. Cook. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks, Eduarda, and thanks to the Future Peds residency. It's an honor to be here tonight. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Jason Espinosa, who completed his medical training at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine his residency at the University of Washington, Seattle Children's Hospital, and fellowship at Northwestern uh, Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. And currently, he's an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics in the Division of Critical Care Medicine at the IU School of Medicine, Riley's Children's Hospital. So, uh, also welcome, Dr. Spinoza. Thank you so much for that introduction. Excited to be here. So thank you all for being here tonight. And without further ado, let's get started with the, our for, uh, frequent ask it questions portion of tonight's webinar. So question number one, what should an LGBTQ plus applicant look for while selecting programs? So who would like to <laughs> answer? I don't know if it was intentional that my face popped up first, if I'm required <laughs> to answer first, but I certainly am happy to take this question uh, or at least attempt to give you some advice. Um, so I actually thought a lot about this and um, 
I think that oftentimes as an LGBT, LGBTQ plus applicant, you probably are thinking I need to be on a coast and I need to be like in a city that's, you know, very affirming for who I am. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that location, you need to be open to programs across the country that are going to be supportive of who you are as an individual and your training experience and are going to make sure that you are well prepared to be whatever type of physician you want to be. So whether that's pediatrics, you want a residency that's going to train you well in pediatrics. I would say that, um, so location, I wouldn't rank it as high in your head. I would, I would just be really open to looking for programs that are recruiting diverse group of, of people who want to train well and programs that are going to prepare you best for whatever future career you have in mind. Um, the other thing that came in mind is when I was looking at like what you should be looking for while selecting a program is look at the makeup of the residency. Uh, so oftentimes a lot of the what residency websites will have pictures of residents. What kind of events are they doing? Are they participating in things like the pride parade and whatever city they're at? Are they participating in kind of wellness activities or advocacy type of work where they're working with organizations such as the AAP to kind of advocate for reproductive rights or for trans rights. So those are things that you want to be looking for. And if you don't see it visibly on the website, I would definitely be asking about it um, when you get interviews or emailing people at those institutions to ask. Those are the, the kind of things that came up to me. And I'm sure uh, the rest of the panel has some uh, other insights as well. Yeah, Jason, this is Stephen Cook. I would totally agree with that. I think one other caveat you know, obviously this is very different today than um, when I applied for residencies and whatnot. Uh, you know, I think I would just kind of just say to this audience, I would say be out as you, uh, as you feel comfortable being out, I guess is something else I would say if, um, I mean, I was out, I guess. Um, I think what Jason was alluding to is maybe how, uh, but I was doing this back in the um, late 80s. Um, so this was a very di different time period than it is today. Um, so I wasn't out um, when I was interviewing. So that's kind of how I was really kind of looking for medical school. You know, I was actually doing medical schools on the coasts um, and residencies on the coast and really not looking anywhere else. Um, and I was just looking at big cities. I think that's a little bit different today. Um, uh, I was looking for LGBTQ visibility. That's kind of what I was looking for, where I think now you can kind of go out and, and do exactly what Jason's saying is, you know, um, you know, you can look for, is there an LGBT? So if you are out and want to be out, um, you know, you can look at your application and are they collecting SOGI data? So that means sexual orientation and gender identity data, but you have to be careful. You can't think, oh, they're collecting SOGI data. I can be out during my interview process because just collection of this data doesn't mean that it's not a guarantee that, you know, we're solving inequities. They may just be collecting this data to help thinking, what can we do for next year or four years down the line? So I think Jason has it really spot on by saying, is there an, L an active LGBTQ um, student organization with good faculty mentors? That may be a, a different approach and a different spin to see what's happening from an organizational standpoint. Because I think that's where most organizations are right now in terms of getting uh, an LGBTQ perspective together at most campuses. I don't know. Um, you know, Juan Carlos, um, what your thoughts are? Yeah, I wanted to echo a lot of what's been said and um, say that in my situation, I'm, I went through family medicine residency. Um, and I think what I was looking for specifically is someone who actually had only been recently, like had only recently came out was I was just at the same time as applying to residency feeling more comfortable being out um, in public with my relationship and bringing uh, my significant other with me to my second look dinners or and this you know it was a different era pre-COVID um, but uh, I was kind of looking for people's reactions and it, you know obviously I was kind of watching for every kind of clue or signal on whether or not I was going to feel comfortable. And 
you know, I, that actually factored into my rank list was how I was kind of regarded. And I just was looking to be seen as a quality applicant who'd make a, you know, a great part of the team, make a great resident make a great uh, physician and a big, I think, you know, I, I just wanted to be received like anyone else and not feel like othered. So I think that's what I was looking for. And in the setting where I was, I don't believe that there were many out residents, especially ones who had an interest themselves in doing LGBT health related stuff. Um, but what I was glad in hindsight that I, I found, and I think I was picking up on it as an applicant, was an environment that would provide me a lot of individual support where I'd feel like seen and nurtured and like my interests supported. So I think that was something that was important to me as someone who had a different experience or kind of felt already a little stigmatized and, and dealing with my own internalized stigma about being gay. Um, but yeah, that's just my my personal experience. Uh, and, you know, I think it's different. You know, I, I take care of a lot of trans folks who are look, going on the process of like applying for college and even some that are in, in, in medical and graduate school. And so I know their experience is are different. I can really just speak for my own. Um, and those just, you know, I think any LGBT person's experience is quite unique, but that was, that was mine. And so I, I guess I, that's just the advice I'd give is um, being out has its advantages. And then you can pick up on those cute, those clues. And I think you just really want to watch for, you're looking for an environment where you're going to feel supported and not judged. I guess I have a whole lot of not much else to add, um, but um, I guess there's some benefit to going last. But, um, you know, I I agree with the location thing because it's the same thing people, um, like even in my field, they're like, are you nuts for doing your field in Texas of all places? Um, but I, I think you also have to be mindful of... Um, what it is you're looking for outside of residency because it's going to take up a significant portion of your time and so um while you don't necessarily need to be in the coasts if you're like hi i'm like a mid 20 something single person who wants to go out and like mingle when i'm not at the hospital you may not want to be in like a small town in the middle of iowa for example no hate on iowa just as an example um because that's you're not going to have a large pool of people and maybe a large place to like go whereas you know i my husband and i started dating when i was in between first and second year of medical school and so by the time we were at residency it was more of like we're also old suburban people and so for us it was just like where can we go and be an old suburban couple in an apartment and things like that and so you know if you're in a relationship what that looks like and so if you just like doing suburban things and cooking and doing a yard or whatever that's fine um so that's where i just i would suggest when you think about location or things think about what your hobbies and things are outside of medicine because you don't want to just be a resident all the time you want to be a person and so that's where i would venture to say although i'm not going to say all but pediatricians in general tend to be nice, warm, accepting people. And so most programs you're going to apply to, even if they're like building, as folks were saying, some kind of pride group or experience for their residents, they're not going to be outwardly hateful. And so you just have to look at what's important to you. And that'll help select some of those things like location or extracurriculars. Because if you like to go boating on the water like don't go to somewhere in the middle of a landlocked place that doesn't have water nearby um so again those are just be a human outside of medicine i guess is my contribution yeah and brett it's funny that you say that about pediatrics and there's actually kind of just one study that i know of when they looked at sexual and gender minorities and choosing specialty choice and there's not a lot of data about this um, and when it came down to looking at sexual gender minorities and they looked at specialty prestige, 
Um, so I always kind of, they didn't really even just define what specialty prestige meant, but I always think of it as being things like cardiothoracic surgery or neurosurgery and probably less inclusive fields. Sexual and gender minorities kind of actually thought those are absolutely exclusive fields. Whereas fields like psychiatry and pediatrics um, were much more inclusive to sexual and gender minority um, people. And that's kind of where we kind of go to move towards. Um, but then the, the caveat being is we need a lot more sexual and gender minorities in urology and cardiology and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to those of you who are considering pediatrics, don't forget we there's lots of pediatric subspecialties where we need lots of LGBTQ uh -huh. folks in those subspecialties of medicine as well. I'm just gonna put in that plug. Thank you all. It was very helpful. Um, so uh, going to our next question, uh, what are the pros and cons about being open about your sexual identity in the context of your application? I believe that we kind of talked about it already, but so um, for this question, we will start with Dr. Cook. Uh, but everyone is welcome to answer, of course. So I'll kind of um, call out the same thing I said during the first question, and this just comes back to being um, being as out as you want to be out um, in medicine or as a trainee or as a medical student. Um, you know, unfortunately, today, and I, I think this took me kind of, as Juan Carlos said as well, it took me a lot of years to decide how out I wanted to be. And I'm pretty out 100% all day, all night at work. And that's in cardiology. Um, and it, it took a long time for me to actually even connect with other LGBTQ cardiologists as well. Um, so when I look at what are the pros and cons, I think that there's still unfortunately a lot of LGBTQ trainees in medicine who experience a lot of discrimination and bullying. And that's actually been well described in the literature. Um, so in medicine, it happens and it causes a lot of burnout. And so what I would you know describe to young trainees, especially if they're coming in and meeting residency directors, my questions would be, if I'm gonna be out as a medical resident today, um, I'd wanna know, you know, what are the discrimination and bullying policy, bullying policies um, at, every new, if, at every new residency program that I'm applying to? And more importantly, you know, are these mechanisms for describe, you know, for discussing bullying um, are they anonymous? I mean, that would be the most important thing. Well, that would be my biggest con, but as a pro, I'd want to know from a, a residency director, how is that being dealt with at your program um, for any person of uh, sexual and gender minority? That's what I would want to know heading into medical school, because this is real. Um, and I think that affects us significantly from a mental health perspective. I I, I don't want to say too much other, you know, I kind of talked about this already a little bit. Um, for me, I used it as kind of like a, a, a way for me to get to gauge um, how comfortable I'd feel there as a resident. So I was kind of, it was for me, it was um, very early on in the process that I was out and, you know, beyond just my close social circle and even some family members that I had come out to. So it was new. And I used it as kind of an opportunity to see just in general, the feeling I got and where I just felt that I was going to be the most um, accepted. I would say that that ended up faring well for me because I felt like I was in an environment where, you know, I was just accepted and, and I was liked for who I am. Um, I'd say now, I think we, it's a little bit different because I think probably since most of us went through our training, there weren't as many universal protection LGBTQ people across the United States. Um, for example, prior to some of the like landmark Supreme Court decisions, I could have probably been fired 
on the, you know, regarding, I mean, I could have possibly been like not, there would have, I don't know exactly how it would have worked with residency, but I mean, Marion County where I currently live, like I, I actually realized in 2020 when they made that Supreme Court decision, the, there were a couple big cases that came out, right? And I don't, I'm not a legal expert, but I remember this because I remember thinking at that time how for granted I took the fact that I could be out as like faculty at my medical school. And it was actually, fortunately I'm in an environment where our identities are kind of celebrated and we have visibility that actually I think helps make our environment more diverse. But um, I, I didn't realize that before that might have not been the case. So I guess I would be watching out to like what to look for is that people are very explicitly having non-discrimination policies that include sexual orientation and gender. And, um, you know, that's more to question number one, but I guess those are pros. And then on the con side, I mean, I did have a medical student who did an elective with me. Um, I tend to attract a lot of LGBTQ plus medical students here who do an elective on LGBT uh, health with me, but they go into all sorts of specialties. Um, and I've had applicants tell me that their mentors told them to make their application less gay or less inclusive of their LGBTQ plus kind of ex relevant experience, even their lived experience and some of their like personal statements, which I found really um, sad, but it's a truth that depending on who they talk to, they're potentially being told. So that must go to say that in some specialties, it's still not very, inclusive or people have this feeling that you have to tone down that part of your identity but you know straight people and cisgender people aren't asked to tone down their identity you know so i guess i have a few thoughts on this um that i will introduce with some caveats when i get to them but i think one of the pros that um you could argue is maybe a con is that part of my role in our residency program is I'm part of a group of folks that every year um, when ARIS opens and we get our pool of applicants, part of what we have tried to do is um, move away a lot from test scores and things like that. Um, while also trying to introduce diversity into our program of all of its flavors. Um, so both what we're talking about right now, racial, ethnic, country of origin, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that I think has always frustrated me as an LGBTQ faculty member is ARIS does not give you a way to identify that. And that is both a pro for some individuals and a con for some individuals. Whereas I can look at ARIS and say ethnicity or race, black slash African-American or white or Asian or whatever. And so we can be more intentional about ensuring that when we select our pool of applicants, it's all not one of some race or another. But there's no way for me to look at an application and be like, this person is LGBTQ unless you tell me. And so I think to Juan Carlos's point, if you quote, take out the gay, there's no way for a program to know who you are. And I can make a lot of inferences if your application has a lot of like pride groups and your activities are all these things, but I can't ask you that. And so it's really the pro would be I can help give you information that I otherwise wouldn't know to give you because I don't know who you are. Um, now, the con is the same thing depending on where you go, if that's all stated, that could work against you. Although again, I my general sense is that in pediatrics, that's probably not a problem, at least for gen peds, um, to Stephen's point about specialties. Um, and so I think the other pro is, I made the conscious decision when I applied to the match the first time and didn't match, I was a little more, um, closeted in a sense and this was 2010 slash 2011 that winter um but the next year when i applied again i was like you know middle finger to this i'm just going to be who i am because i don't want to be at a place that doesn't want me and so i just went full scale and talked about you know my boyfriend at the time and um things like that and then kind of watched reactions and i had none that were negative um and so i think those are my big pros to this is that there's no way to identify on an heiress form to help folks try and be more thoughtful about recruitment messages to you in a way that's looking at DEI across the program um, because it's not a field 
Um, so I guess that's what I would add about um, the pro. And then I guess I'm one of those people that I also, I think from a con, what I would add to this conversation is you also have to think about the layer of multiple identities that each of us wears. And so when you think about, for example, the privilege that white cisgender gay men may have over a person of color who identifies differently um, in our society, you also have to, I think, factor that in. And I hate that I have to say that. Um, so that's the piece that I would add is think about the multiple identities you wear um, and where you're going and what how those identities web, um, because they may, unfortunately, in some places, get you treated differently, um, I think much to the chagrin of those of us on this call. Um, so that's the other piece I would add, is that you just have to think about that, whether it's your gender, your race, and then being LGBTQ and how that, that plays in. Uh, it's kind of hard to go last now because everyone said a lot of great things, but um, I'll echo a lot of what's already been said um, by first by Brett. I, I would echo everything he said about pediatrics. I would say um, across the board, I would say most programs, if not all, would be incredibly open-minded and welcoming to anyone who decided to put it on their um, application. And I agree as a pro, it potentially could um, show a little bit of a side of you for who you are and how open you decide to be and how out you decide to be as a resident or in residency. Um, I think you just have to take the good and the bad with it. We are in an incredibly um, different time than we were uh, 20 years ago even, but I will say even as a resident and in fellowship, I was in major cities and there was still discrimination because you oftentimes will take care of families from very rural areas who have never met or seen a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And so they might make comments or make statements um, based on your appearance or your dress or your mannerisms uh, that uh, are hurtful and it sucks. Um, in those instances, I think knowing what your support system is, is your leadership in your corner? Are they gonna kind of double down and, and be your backup and support in those instances is a great question that Stephen brought up. And I would completely say you need to ask about, um, you know, is there an anti-discrimination policy? What are the ways that residents can anonymously report someone? And maybe it's not a patient, maybe it's a nurse, maybe it's a co-resident, co that's even worse, but you wanna make sure that those systems are in place. So I think it could be both a pro and a con, but I don't think, I wish it wasn't a con that you were saying, like, I, I want to be myself. I wish that wasn't a con, but I would agree that there are probably some people who might read your application file and, and see that as a negative. And I wish that weren't true, but it may be true in some instances. In which case, I think if you decide to write about your experiences as part of the LGBTQ plus community, either in the form of kind of putting down it, putting down your kind of events, activities, pride groups, uh, volunteer work you've done, research, if you've worked with a researcher or faculty mentor, those experiences can be really meaningful to you and something to talk about. So I don't think you should shy away from putting that on your application. If you decide to share your coming out experience or something that's more personal in your personal statement, I have read personal statements from medical students and they can be really, I think, really, really moving and empowering. I think if you're going to touch on something that's really personal about your identity, I would say my one caveat to that is just make sure that the that you're utilizing that story to share who you are as an individual and how you're going to bring something to this program and why you as an applicant are going to bring something unique as a from your perspective to add to the program that's going to enhance your training as a pediatrician as an internal medicine doctor as xyz whatever specialty you decide obviously i would love for everyone to be a pediatrician but i'm biased um so i think keeping that in mind uh you know okay, I'm going to share this really compelling story of when I came out when I was 12 years old and you go into this thing, if it turns into this like trauma dump, that might be a red flag. So that could be a con. So you know what I'm saying? Like you have to keep it in mind, like whatever story you decide to share, if that's something that's really important to you, make sure that you are utilizing the story in a way that's highlighting who you are as an individual and your strengths as a person and not necessarily, I have these years of trauma and I'm going to bring them to your program. Uh, because that's also a red flag for some places, unfortunately. 
Thank you. Well, um, so next question. Uh, what can individuals who do not identify as LGBTQ plus do, uh, do to be an ally? We'll start with Dr. Venice. Is that okay? <laughs> that sounds great. Um, I think this is a really important question and I, I think that there, I think any, you know, regardless of your identity or who you are, if you're on here, I think there's a lot you can do. Obviously you're here showing support at our home institutions where we are. I mean, if somebody says something and we're in a position where we can just say, hey, I don't, I don't think that's the right way to refer to this person or, you know, um, kind of pull them aside in a way that's appropriate and doesn't put them on the spot and just kind of explain, you know, why you think maybe they said something that could have been um, discrimin discriminatory. I think that's something that we can do in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, it can be a little hard in the setting, especially if you're a, a clinical in cl a clinical trainee and, you know, there's a lot of hierarchy um, built into that environment that sometimes makes it hard to report or to say something. But a lot of medical schools, I think, are having ways and um, procedures for students to kind of report concerns. I think that's something that we can do to build more um, inclusive cultures in our institutions where we are at. And that has a ripple effect. Um, so I think that's something you can do wherever you are now as a student or in the future as a resident where you are. Um, you know, during this whole application process, it's quite different now being in a virtual world, but I think that, and it's not exactly the, the I, I'm trying to think of when I was going through residency interviews or audition rotations, um, and electives where I was felt like I was kind of on the spot. Uh, you know, if I would have felt as empowered to be able to speak up if I saw something wrong. But I, you know, times have changed pretty quickly, and I, there are a lot of mechanisms for trying to do what I said before. So I, I would just encourage folks to to not be silent, and I think that's how you really uh, live out allyship um, and you know really be be a support to your your LGBTQ plus colleagues uh, and applicants and you know just treating people re with respect asking them how they like to be addressed introducing yourself with your pronouns I think are really great ways to signal that you're a person with whom, um, that you understand the importance of acknowledging people uh, with respect and how they they um, want to be addressed and how they should be addressed. So that's what immediately came to mind. It's kind of a, a tricky thing because I know auditions can, I'm sorry, uh, applications, they can feel like auditions. It's, it can be a really uh, a tough situation to be in, but I think you know those just are kind of some broad rules that I would say. What do, what do my co-panelists uh, think here? I'm, I'm going to lean on you. I wonder if you have any other creative ideas. I, I like the thought of an application as an audition. That's actually a very appropriate metaphor. Like you have to put on an act, I guess. Um, although I don't like when people do that. Um, so I guess I would add role modeling is actually the biggest thing to answer this question. And so when those allies are in situations how do they role model asking people their name that they like to go by um or you know as i always teach our residents many of whom are not lgbtq um that it's okay to walk in and say like hi do you go by susie because that's the name on the chart and while i can go in epic and change their their name like you know you see, my name is actually, that's my legal first name, but I don't go by that. I just go by Brett. And so like, you could even just change my preferred name to Brett and Epic. Um, and so, and introducing like, you know, I'm Dr. Whoever, my pronouns are he, him, or she, her, whatever they are. And then your role modeling 
how to do that for for others. Um, and I think when your LGBTQ colleagues need you, I think it's also listening and not being performative um, in the sense that um, I felt very lucky um, that we haven't had to have any issues so far in the, the month and a half that our chiefs are chiefs this year. But last year, we actually had a resident who was like, I am not seeing trans people um, because that goes against my belief and they are not real. And I was like, okay, no, this is not happening. And so we called the chiefs and I was like, yeah, this is not going to work. And so this program needs to have something there because if you are a physician, you cannot walk in a room and be like, oh, hi, you're trans and turn around and walk out. Um, that is not going to work. And so it was actually my allies as the chief residents who were like, we drafted this statement. This is an expectation of residents. And while I can't make this like new policy in the middle of an academic year, starting actually last month, this is now the expectations of residents when they're on their adolescent rotation. And if they refuse to see a patient, that is going to be a disciplinary thing in the file. And so that was not my idea to make this policy. That was the allies. And so they realized the reasons why this is an issue. And so use your allies as allies. And, you know, you may have to explain to this, but that I think was actually very good professional role modeling on behalf of the chief residents for recognizing a problem and then doing something and saying, instead of saying like, yeah, we'll talk to them like this, we'll just talk to them. Um, they actually did something um, and took that to our program director who was like, sure, sounds good to me. Um, so I guess that's a good example of what I can use as allies truly being an ally and stepping up to the plate. Um, yeah, this is this is a, a really good question. I think it's important um, because I felt um, I, I, I again I was I was out in residency. I was at a large pediatrics residency. I was one of several out residents, which I was very fortunate to have that within my class, but I would say I, I agree role modeling can be huge um, with my non LGBTQ plus allies, because just hearing them being empowered to kind of step up for you. Um, I think the tools that we use for allyship are really just like identifying phrases. So if you see something where one of your colleagues may have experienced you know, something hurtful being said or something discriminatory being said, you know, kind of pulling them aside one on one and, and, and having that kind of debrief moment and validating what they've been through is, is huge. Um, and then I think likewise, if you're at a program and you have LGBTQ plus allies, which, you know, it's going to be more common, hopefully, for our provider force for the next generation of physicians. Uh, you know, you want to be someone who's going to be a colleague, but also going to advocate in the same situations. If there's a par parent or a patient that's saying something discriminatory, you know, making a policy that's going to say, hey, you know, as a clinic practice group, we need to have a no tolerance for this type of behavior. And if they're seeing my colleague and they need to treat them with the same level of respect that they treat everybody else. So those are kind of formative things you can do. And then I would say from an advocacy standpoint, you know, in residency, if you're at a residency program, you know, are there local or national organizations that the residents get involved with? Like, again, I keep going back to the AAP. Again, I'm biased because I think pediatricians are the best, but the AAP is a great organization that has both local and national presence. And as a resident, um, a lot of my co-residents were very involved and would go to conferences and would speak on LGBTQ ally, allyship and would go to um, education seminars and go out to like high schools and teach sex ed and stuff like that. So there are many ways to be an ally without being necessarily a member of this community. And you can support at all different levels. And I think it's it's on the individual basis, it, it's it's more impactful, but certainly on a, on a more advocacy level, you can do a lot with it. Yeah, I'll just kind of wrap it up with a couple last things, because I think everyone said some really smart things here. Um, you know, terminology and language is so incredibly important in healthcare. And, you know, it's 
not, you know, it's pronouns and I think gender neutral language is next level cultural competency, right? It's not just our patients, it's our peers um, because we don't live in a heterosexual environment. You know, I always kind of tell all of our cardiology fellows that this is not, you know, we don't live in a heteronormative environment anymore. And if you assume that, you know, it's not just our patients, it's our peers, right? And that's just kind of, to me, is lack of cultural competency. Um, and when we talk to our patients this way, if we just say, oh, hey, what is, if you have a woman in front of you, say, what does your husband do? You, you've just lost a lack of trust uh, with your patient. And it's very unlikely that that patient's, you know, if I do that as a cardiologist with an LGBTQ patient, it's very unlikely that that patient's gonna follow my recommendations, come back to the clinic. And, and, and that's very well shown in transgender health, um, that, that patients won't come back for preventative and urgent care visits. So just knowing language, pronouns, and how, how would you like to be addressed today is incredibly important. The other thing that I really wanna just say one more time, I love the way that Juan Carlos is talking about how do we respond to microaggressions and this is an art, right? Um, because it's how do we call in or call out somebody? Um, and I'm so, I grew up in Boston, so I'm so type A and say a lot of very inappropriate things. So I'm trying to move from calling out to what I tell all my trainees to do, which is calling in because typically I'm the first, because whoever came up with the word microaggressions, it should be a macroaggression, right? If someone told me that my essay sounded really gay, I would probably flip over the handlebars um, thus, and then start calling out. I would just say, that's really triggering and extremely offensive. But the person causing the microaggression just doesn't hear what I have to say. So it's really about calling in. So, you know, just saying, you know, if you said that to me, I'm just curious, what was your intention? Why would you say that? So really pulling the person in and just helping them understand that what they're saying is really offensive. And, you know, I can't thank Juan Carlos for bringing that up today. And just how do we respond to microaggressions? How do we redirect what's being said is truly, is truly offensive to an LGBTQ person. And as an ally, you can also do that. It doesn't have to be the LGBTQ person who's receiving that microaggression in that moment. Because as the LGBTQ person, we just feel so horrible. It's hard for us to respond sometimes in that moment. Um, so an ally can really truly step up and, you know, take the lead in that, in that moment and can really sometimes be a hero at that time. So thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, next question. Uh, when it comes to applying to residency, what resources are currently available for LGBTQ plus applicants? So we can start with Dr. Cooper. Sure. Um, I will say that I'm old and dated, and there are probably more like rooms that students use now to like communicate about ideas that are in like Reddit forums and things like that. Um, so I think that other people's experiences can be helpful, although do not rely on them entirely. Um, which is the same thing I tell like my third year med students or second year med students who are just starting clerkship, do not listen to your upperclassmen because there could be circumstances that are not relevant to you. Uh, but I think it's good for a broad feel about like what has their experience been in a, a program um, or when they interviewed at a, a program. Um, and then actually I have seen a lot on Twitter. Um, so if you are active on Twitter, um, there's certainly um, folks who will um, reach out, or you can look for certain hashtags um, that can be helpful, and those folks can DM you about um, kind of what's going on. Um, and I guess that's the big thing I would say is networking can be helpful, but it that's hard, right, if you're kind of shy about doing that. Um, but I think hearing from the experiences of folks can be um, really helpful. Um, but I think you also have to keep in mind that um, one thing I will say is um, just using my own experience in the sense that um, I don't have time to go into what happened specifically, but our program slash the university, I should say, took a very large hit 
um, due to a decision that was made back last November um, and was dragged through the mud um, as it relates to certain aspects of LGBTQ care. Um, but I would say that is not reflective of the program, if that makes sense. And so that was a decision made by people like way above our program. Um, so you don't always want to like look at what you read because I think our program is very welcoming. And I had um, just a resident who is LGBTQ just finished two weeks with us and he's living his best life um, with his husband. And so in Dallas. And so I think you have to take those things for a grain of salt for some things that are more administrative decisions. Um, but how does that factor in? And so please come to our program. That's not to say don't come. Um, but you know, we are very nice and thrilling. So again, everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt, I guess is the big message, but ask others' opinions. Thank you. Um, so uh, next question, uh, what is the importance of identifying as a LGBTQ plus in your respective field? I uh, I would I threw so I can I'll take a stab at this, but I also wanted to just mention I put something in the chat box um, that Med Student Pride Alliance I've heard about because I was involved with Outcare Health, um, which is an organization that actually a med student started here at IU School of Medicine. It's an online directory for helping LGBTQ plus folks find. Um, Healthcare providers and all different specialties and dis like uh, area types of healthcare providers like mental health and et cetera. Um, that's also a potential resource too. Uh, it's not to say that people who aren't on there like don't exist or that they're because there's it's still a growing network, but you could just kind of look and see who's listed themselves in a particular area if you're venturing into a state or locale where you're not super familiar. Um, you know, I, I wanted to say what Dr. Cooper said about folks in Texas, I'm in Indiana, you know, it's not known as being historically the most friendly to LGBTQ plus people, but like we are everywhere and I don't want people to discount considering a great opportunity for training in a place like that, because if you look around, you may find lots of support and us being out and part of these communities is part of the change that needs to happen. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I wanted to echo what Dr. Cooper said. That's not to say um, that you need to, you know, make sacrifices of what your, your happiness is. Like if you need to be near the ocean or you need to be where there are mountains or whatever it is you need, you also just need to take care of yourself beyond that part of your, your identity. Um, and then just to this question, um, you, this is kind of, uh, this is a difficult question. I think I, I struggled with an internalized homophobia more than I realized. I used to have a lot of kind of shame about having a rainbow on my badge. Like I would even not wear my badge into exam rooms with certain patients. Um, it was kind of after a few years that I, you know, even into my life beyond residency that I felt more comfortable just being myself and not, you know, caring. Um, so I want to say that the, that, that is what's important is that, you know, I am visible as someone who's part of the LGBTQ community and not that it's something I bring up all the time, but when I've been in a situation caring for a patient who's specifically dealing with a lot of stress or depression because of their identity. I think being open about my own identity, you know, either in whatever way, I mean, sometimes patients just know because they read my bio online or my LinkedIn or something and they find me specifically because of that. But I feel like it's been able to help me build bridges and help patients who are specifically looking for someone, you know, who understands parts of what it's like to have one of those identities um, so I'd say that that's kind of like the part that's fulfilling about being a, you know, a physician and taking care of people, uh, that, that 
has been gratifying. There's a lot of other reasons and important uh, importance to that. I'll let other people chime in on. Uh, I'll go next. I'll say for me, um, there are kind of, as I alluded to earlier, there are cardiology is lacking in diversity. Uh, we really struggle with this. Um, I'm part of the American College of Cardiology Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. Um, so I was actually just kind of speaking with Brett in the chat, letting him know that I'm kind of close co colleagues with uh, the chair of that task force, who's actually at UT Southwestern. Um, anyway, so, you know, for me, kind of being openly gay um, throughout residency, fellowship, and as a junior faculty member in cardiology has been, you know, really rewarding for me to kind of, for two things. One, kind of as Juan Carlos said to me, it's actually, you know, so I'll always kind of throw a rainbow badge on my jacket or my pin or whatever for a whole bunch of reasons. One, it helps trainees identify me as an identity, what I call as an identity concordant mentor, because it took me almost my whole career to actually find other gay cardiologists. Um, I never found a gay mentor throughout my whole career. So I kind of, you know, it was helpful for me to have good allies who were, you know, kind of recognized me. It was okay to be gay um, and said, you'll make a great cardiologist regardless of being gay. Because all my mentors were these kind of cisgender, senior, heterosexual males. That was a really big struggle for me as a cardiologist. Um, and so kind of had no you know, nobody to kind of look up to. Um, so that's why it's really rewarding for me to be openly gay. I've met a lot of young gay trainees who want to go into cardiology. So it's been really awesome to be what I call an identity concordant mentor. Um, and the other thing, the flip side is having patients that may come in from really deep pockets of Indiana um, who are maybe struggling with their identity or gay and come into clinic, see my badge and they'll kind of, they just kind of subtly ask during clinic, um, are you wearing that to be open or are you, they kind of, and I just say yes, because they're really looking to kind of just open themselves up to somebody else um, in, in, in medicine. So that's why it's just so, that's why it's important to me to identify as openly gay in medicine, because it can be tough, I think, for some of our patients. So that's kind of what's, that's for me, why it's so rewarding to be openly gay in cardiology. Thank you so much. Well, uh, since we it's getting close to an hour, uh, I I would like to invite our our panelists to add any additional thoughts as we close. Uh, so be be free to <laughs> to share your thoughts. I guess I'll just say it's an exciting time, I think, to be a medical trainee. I think that this new generation of physicians who are entering residency or starting medical school, I think, are much more open-minded, much more forward-thinking, and and like Dr. Cook was saying, thinking about things like they want to be trained on the right language. They want to be providing holistic and comprehensive care to a wide variety of patients. So I think that you can bring this momentum of things you're hearing from here and and kind of take that forward and like what kind of physician do you want to be, what kind of resident do you want to be, how can you really advocate for change in your own environment and and feel like you can feel supported and being who you authentically want to be as a resident and um, finding that space there's there's a program for you out there I promise. It doesn't seem like it at times, but there there will be a place for you somewhere. Yeah, Jason, I would agree with that. I think that the days of not having mentor, like identity concordant mentors are going to get fewer and fewer. And I'm hoping that there are going to be more LGBTQ mentors in pediatrics, medicine, cardiology, 
family practice, you name it. And I would wish you all the best of luck in your careers. Um, and if you feel comfortable, you know, coming out on your applications, you know, more power to you as you embark upon your applications. All great final comments. I just want to echo them all. The last thing I don't, I'd say is, I don't know anyone. I, I'm fortunate to get to work with a lot of the other LGBTQ plus identifying colleagues who are faculty at our medical school. I don't think any of them would ever turn down a student or not respond to them who's specifically seeking them out. I feel like it can be intimidating sometimes to ask to meet with someone to maybe see if you can gain some mentorship or advice. Um, but I just know that we're here and that's, we remember very well what those experiences are like sometimes and are always happy to, to help out. So uh, thanks for having this event and for having all of us. So, um, Thank you so much, Dr. Rennis, Dr. Cooper, who had to uh, leave uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Cook for all of this valuable information. Uh, it was super helpful and we are very thankful for you to taking the time out of your day uh, to speak to us. Amazing. Thank you so much to the speakers. This was an amazing discussion. I, I very insightful and I felt like a lot of candid comments and just really appreciate it. And thank you so much to our future Pedras all stars who put this together, the LGBTQ plus team and the equity team members. Eduarda, thank you for hosting and Sergio did a lot of work reaching out to find these amazing panelists. So thank you to both of you guys. Huge shout out. And um, we're hopeful that everyone got something interesting and useful and inspiring out of today's session. So thank you for coming. As usual, thank you to APPD, Comcept for all of all of the guidance and help. We do have the Southeast webinar, regional webinar coming up this Thursday. And we will have a wrap up session where we'll be doing a lot of general advice and talking about the virtual interview season on the 23rd. So uh, those hopefully will both be useful sessions and keep following up with us. Thank you again and thank you everyone for attending and like Amy said we're having the Southeast Re um, Regional Webinar tomorrow and um, then the wrap-up we webinar on the 23rd of August. You can register by visiting our website at futurepeachres.com and clicking on webinar registration series here on the home page. Also to stay tuned to all things Future Peds Res and Peds Match 2023, give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and sign up for the listserv on our website. We thank you all again to all our panelists and attendees for tonight. We wish everyone a great remainder of the evening or morning, and we look forward to seeing you at all our upcoming webinars. <laughs>